Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Well, don't you worry. Sit back, relax, and join in the conversation as we talk with today's guest. Welcome to another LSB Film Productions podcast with your host, Chris Brooks. Hello and welcome to the channel. It's me, Chris Brooks, and today I'm joined with the wonderful and renowned Dr. Sarah Myhill. And Sarah Myhill is going to talk to us primarily about why the NHS is in freefall. So without further ado, welcome to the channel. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chris. Well, I'll just give you a little bit of background history because I come from a long line of doctors. My grandmother was one of the first women uh, doctors. She qualified in 1922 uh, and she married another doctor. Um, uh, so my father was a doctor. His brother was a doctor. My brothers. So I've seen the history of health over you know best part of 100 years. Mm -hmm. My grandparents, when they started medicine in the 1920s, um, it was all private medicine then. And when the NHS came into existence in 1948, um, they said that was the best day of their lives because suddenly um, um, they could treat anybody um, without expense being an issue. And my father and his brother and, um, um, and then, uh, some years my brother worked in general practice where those doctors were responsible for the health of local people. And mm. if anything went wrong, the finger was pointed at them. They looked after a local, local hospital where they could take acute sick. What, you mean when people sick. used to be accountable? Correct. They oh, were blimey. absolutely accountable. And they worked, um, be, they were trained to be doctors, and they worked by looking at the clinical picture, asking the question, why does this person have a problem, and treating them uh, appropriately. Now, problems started when Big Pharma moved in. Because we now are in a situation where, you know, fast forward to the 21st century, uh, medical education is now run by Big Pharma. And Big Pharma's mantra is a patient cured is a customer lost. Yeah. And what Big Pharma want is they want lots of sick people taking lots of symptom suppressing drugs because follow the money. Now, in the 1980s, you know, I qualified in 81 and I went into general practice then. And of course, the first question that people ask me when they come in is, you know, why have I got arthritis? Why have I got migraine? You know, why am I overweight? You know, why have I got high blood pressure? And I suddenly realized that my medical education didn't equip me to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started to, so at least I had the decency to say to my patients, I don't know, but I can look it up. You know, I can phone a friend. We can work on this together. Most and doctors, when I, whenever, sorry for interrupting, but whenever I've gone into a, a doctor's surgery to an issue, the first thing they do is go and Google. Uh, well, absolutely. And you, and guess what? I use Google if I don't know the answer to a question as well. But of course, um, you know, fast forward to the present day, I now know that the vast majority of Western disease has very clear causes and they can be addressed through changing your diet, your lifestyle, taking nutritional supplements, doing detox regimes or whatever. So I did 20 years as an NHS GP up until about 2000. And um, in parallel with this, I got friends and uh, friends of patients, relatives of patients, others who wanted to consult me privately. And um, um, by the late 1990s, I was getting into trouble with the NHS because my prescribing costs were so low. Because I had such a low budget for drugs, that made me a bad doctor. You know, I was obviously missing those cases of diabetes and cholesterol. No, I was treating them with lifestyle regimes. Hmm. So basically so, doctors are uh, salesmen, aren't they? Correct. They have become puppets of big pharma. Hmm. And guess what? They make lots of lovely money at it too. Now, that might not be direct payments, but it's certainly indirect payments with respect to going on courses, um, uh, receiving gifts, uh, entertainment, you know, or whatever, whatever. And and the worst of it is, is that big farmers moved up another step and they have now brainwashed, you know, the, the powers that be, the health authorities and ICE guidelines, the General Medical Council and so on, which means that anybody who steps outside those guidelines um, gets um, investigated by the General Medical Council. Now, the GMC should be there to ensure good standards in clinical practice. But when I left the NHS, having had 20 years of um, unblemished record, went into independent practice, I put up my own website where 
anything I knew or um, advice on, in, on, on information on, on diseases was there free, freely available for anybody to access. And as soon as that started happening, the General Medical Council started to investigate me. So I am now the most investigated doctor in the history of the GMC, <laughs> despite no patient complaints um, and nobody being put at risk of, of, of harm or danger and, and nobody being harmed. In fact, one of the most revealing comments came from a Freedom of Information Act search, the GMC, from uh, one of their advisors, Mr. Tom Clark QC, where it said the problem with the Myhill cases is that all the patients are better and none of them will complain about her or give witness statements against her. So, you know, that shows that the prosecution by the GMC has been entirely politically driven. Mm. And I am now on investigation number 44. Um, uh, although I haven't paid my GMC fees since 2020, I don't have medical insurance, um, I don't do revalidation, the GMC still take it upon themselves to launch new investigations against me um, of their own initiation. So it just shows what a pernicious bunch they are. But yeah. what they are trying to do is they are trying to railroad doctors into following the NHS guidelines. And, um, um, you know, and so doctors, have, be, as you say, they become puppets of Big Pharma and there's no thinking that goes into their um, um, uh, advice. So I'll just give you an example. I had a patient who came to see me the other day and um, she'd been admitted to hospital with chest pain. So, of course, you immediately think, oh, heart attack. She had all the investigations, including an angiogram, which showed that her coronary arteries were perfect. No sign of atherosclerosis, no sign of clotting, whatever, whatever. But she came out of that hospital with the five drugs that are given to people who got had heart attacks, you know, uh, a, plate, a, a blood thinner, um, a beta blocker, um, an ACE inhibitor, a statin, uh, um, uh, blood pressure drugs, and so on. Although she had no indication that she had any of those problems. I mean, when she came to see me, of course, it was then obvious what she did have. She had something called Tietz's syndrome, which is a costochondritis, which, yes, it's painful. It it looks the pain looks like that of a heart attack, but actually it's the cartilages themselves that are inflamed. And guess what? It's settled down with some anti-inflammatory um, magnesium sprays and so on. So what it tells us is that medicine in this country is protocol driven, and the protocols are written by big pharma. And doctors do no longer use their brains when uh, diagnosing people. So mm. it's all about symptom suppression with drugs. Now, the point here is we have symptoms for very good reason. Symptoms is nature's early warning flag saying there's something wrong. You need to do something about it. Um, and, you know, you know, we should have a logical approach, which is, you know, symptom means something's, something's gone wrong. So what is that something that's gone wrong? What is that mechanism? Now, of course, what the drugs do is they just suppress the symptom. So, for example, if somebody comes on with eczema, which is an inflammation of the skin, which is nearly always allergy, they just get steroid creams to put on. And steroid creams, OK, they damp down the inflammation in the skin. But, of course, they're absorbed and that can have side effects. And, of course, they, they can thin the skin. And that is a problem. So steroid creams are not the answers to eczema. They are not the answer to psoriasis, for example. We have to ask the question why. Ditto migraine. Migraine is the typical allergic headache. And so often when people change their diets and they cut out the major triggers like the gluten grains, like the dairy products, the migraine disappears. Ditto arthritis. You know, ditto irritable bowel syndrome. You know, ditto psychiatric and psychological conditions. Almost any Western pathology you care to um, mention or care to name is amenable to this approach. So now I continue to work um, as a naturopathic physician. So I use my medical knowledge and my medical qualifications, but I can get people well without using drugs. So is that more like a holistic? Absolutely. And, and I mean, all these words, naturopathic, holistic, functional medicine, alternative medicine, you know, they're all amount to the same thing. It's simply we are looking for causation. We mm. are asking the question, why? Now, I can tell you, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly have all the the right questions. And at least having the right questions mean that when you stumble upon an answer, for example, at the moment I'm um, investigating light therapy um, as, as a treatment for inflammation and as a treatment for chronic infection. Um, um, you know, but I've stumbled that because I've helped asking the right questions. And and say, if you ask the right questions, then you find the right answers. 
Well, that's good. What What's your opinions on frequency based treatment? Well, it's 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 entirely logical. Um, and there's a wonderful technique called frequency-specific microcurrents, um, which is very effective to treat many people who've got pain syndromes. Because, I mean, obviously I'm looking for the cause of the pain, but sometimes you, know, um, you have pain causes and you can't find an obvious reason, but frequency-specific microcurrents is a very promising way to treat chronic pain. So, you know, uh, I don't do that because it's it's time consuming, but I do know therapists who can offer that. So I can obviously then refer to that. So between us naturopathic, you know, physicians and functional doctors, we have a network of skills. Mm. And basically we all offer the same basic package that anybody can do at home. Doesn't need a doctor, doesn't even need a therapist. And I've written many books about it. Um, this is the latest one that's come out is this one here about chronic fatigue syndrome. That's my special area of interest. Um, and um, I've written, this is the third edition of it, and I've written it for people because there are not enough doctors to go round. And in that book is the absolute bare minimum that we should all be doing in order to recover from that wretched illness. And it's all stuff you can do yourself. Diets, nutritional supplements, vitamin C, iodine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, nothing difficult about it. And, um, you know, I should on not on a daily basis, but very often I will get an email completely out of the blue from somebody who said, thank you for supplying those regimes. I got better or words to that effect. That's good. See, I was really surprised when King Charles, I don't like calling him King Charles, but when he said he was going down the holistic route with his cancer treatment, that he didn't want to go down the chemotherapy Route. Well, 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 Prince Charles, bless him, or King Charles, I should say, bless him, has a long been an advocate of natural medicine. And so indeed, I believe, are the whole royal family. And um, and that possibly at least partly accounts for their longevity. Um, but yes, uh, and, and again, he's absolutely right. You know, holistic medicine is all about asking the question why. It's interesting that King Charles sh should develop um, prostate cancer because the major risk factors for that would be dairy products and carbohydrate-based diets, uh, i.e. West and Western diets uh, uh, have are high in dairy products and high in um, um, carbohydrates. But I'm guessing, unfortunately, that involves it includes chocolate, doesn't it? It does indeed. And yeah, now, see, I'm knackered. You, what you've done now is you put your finger on one of my favourite subjects, which is addiction. Now, we use addictions to deal with stress. You know, when I was being done by the GMC, I had to have a couple of glasses of wine at night, just have, you know, an hour of the day where I could just kind of wipe it out because that was very stressful. But, and some people use cigarette smoking for um, to, um, to, to calm themselves. Some people use caffeine to fire them up. But the commonest addiction and the most pernicious addiction worldwide is addiction to sugar, processed foods and carbohydrates. And, um, and you know, we, as I say, we use addiction to deal with stress. So when I was working in Nottinghamshire, the favourite addiction there was a chip butty. So chips mm. between white bread. Um, in Scotland, it's a deep fried Mars bar, you know, um, or a sugar sandwich. I've never understood that. I've never understood that. <laughs> but the point is, sugar in the short term has a calming effect on us. And it gives us a little hit of energy because sugar is rocket fuel. But unfortunately, that doesn't last very long. It lasts maybe in an hour or so, and then the blood sugar levels start to fall. And then we get all the symptoms of sugar withdrawal and we go for something sweet to buck ourselves up mm. again. So the typical Westerner, you know, wakes up in the morning feeling maximally withdrawn, often having had a poor night's sleep because addiction disturbs sleep better than anything else. So they wake up in the morning maximally withdrawn and they go for a fruit juice, toast, porridge, cereals, something like that. And the blood sugar comes flying up. Now that will, it, it goes up and that keeps them going till maybe nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then it starts to fall. Mm. And as the blood sugar level falls, the brain goes into panic mode because it thinks it's running out of fuel and says, you must have something sweet. So guess what? They have a sweet drink or a biscuit or a piece of cake or a bag of crisps or something like that. And that keeps them going till lunchtime. And then the same thing happens. And then they have a sandwich, pizza, baked potato or something like, and that keeps them going. And then it's tea and then it's supper and so on. So they're having to eat very regularly throughout the day to keep their blood sugar up and to keep going. And it's all the wrong stuff. And it's all the wrong stuff because it's carbohydrates. Now, the starting point 
for me to treat absolutely everything. And anybody listening to this, um, if they want to live life to their full potential um, in terms of quality and quantity, and you don't want to get dementia, and you don't want to get cancer, and you don't want to get heart disease, we should all be eating the evolutionary correct diet, which is what primitive man and primitive woman has been eating for hundreds of thousands of years. And that is a paleo ketogenic diet. Paleo, because we cut out the gluten grains and the dairy products. And ketogenic, because it's very low carbohydrate. Uh, because, as I say, carbohydrates drive all pathologies. So, for example. So what is paleo? Paleo is no gluten grains and no dairy products. Because so vegan. Not... Almost no, a veganist. No, no, not vegan. Because meat, you can have meat, fish, eggs, okay. and then staple foods. Any vegetables, um, low carb fruits like berries are fine. Um, and then I use a lot of coconut, linseed, low carb grains like uh, chia, um, desiccated coconuts. I use those sort of things for making crumbles or baking or whatever. So it's a very varied diet. Um, it takes a little bit more organization simply because the shops are not um uh this way oriented you know you mm. go into a supermarket you go into a when you fill up your car with petrol which of course is another addiction or diesel you go in there and everything on the shelves is addiction it's all sugar smoking alcohol uh, fast carbohydrates bread grains dairy etc 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 and the it's other of course the other trouble is nowadays especially is that the cost of living all all the healthy foods are really expensive and don't last very long, like your fruit and veg. Correct. That is undoubtedly an issue. But, you know, carbohydrates are cheap, convenient and addictive. They are the big problems. Mm. But, the, again, the awful thing is, you know, these days we spend less and less on food relative to our total budget. I mean, in medieval times, about a third of the activity of, of, of the whole medieval court was about food production and gathering and so on and so forth. You know, when my, when I was a child, I can remember my mother going off to Sainsbury's once a week and spending 20 pounds. And I was thinking, gosh, that's an absolute fortune. And of course it was a fortune, but um, you know, it was a big chunk of the family weekly budget. And nowadays there's a temptation to go for cheap foods because they're cheap, convenient foods because you don't have to do any preparation and addictive foods because that helps us deal with stress. So there's a huge draw to these processed um, you know, carb-based foods, which is great for company profits and disaster for our health. Mm -hmm. And you know, just making more, like you said, making more customers for the uh, yes, yes, pharmaceutical. Big, yes, big food makes loads of money from eat, from selling cheap, addictive foods, and then that makes people sick. So then, big farmers on the on the on the bandwagon. Then you know, with all their expensive drugs, so it's a real treadmill. And you know, it's because the diet is difficult. And because it's the first thing you have to do, so many people just you know, fall at the first fence. They look at the diet and think, oh, I can't do that. And they give up. Um, but early dementia, uh, you know, heart disease, uh, early cancer can be reversed by a paleo ketogenic diet. Now, I don't say I see a lot of patients with dementia or cancer because my main interest is chronic fatigue syndrome. But you know, they do very well, guess what, if they stick to the regimes. What makes cancer cells different from normal cells? And remember, we are all throwing up cancer cells all the time. Um, uh, in fact, the, the, the facts are that um, we produce about 10,000 DNA mutations every second. So we're constantly damaging our DNA. And that might be from background radiation or whatever, or toxins or whatever. But we have systems to heal and repair that. And we have our immune system that goes trotting around the body, and this is called immune surveillance. And if it sees a cell that's abnormal, that doesn't conform to type, it'll gobble it up and get rid of it. But can't say cancer cells can only run on sugar. And the higher your blood sugar, the faster they grow. So if you are growing cancer cells at a faster rate than you can nip them off, you then have a clinical problem. And, um, and we are seeing epidemics of cancer at the moment. And much of that is driven by high sugar, High carbohydrate diets. Right, it's funny actually because when I I I had testicular cancer, uh, I think back in back in twenty seventeen. What we're talking about two thousand and seven. Yeah, and I had one dose of chemo, and I completely went off chocolate. 
<laughs> which is bizarre because I love chocolate. But well, you know, you're, that... I mean, you know, you, we, we all live stress lives and I'm quite sure you live a stress life too. But we use chocolate and sugar to deal with that stress because it, it affords, you know, a little window of time of calm where we think, oh, you know, we can deal with the next thing that life throws at us. But uh, and believe you me, I'm a good addict. You know, my, both my t parents died of you know alcohol addiction essentially, um, and I know I could happily become an alcohol addict. But what they say about addiction is it's a good servant but a bad master. Yes. So yes, guess what? I do enjoy the occasional bar of chocolate, but I use the eighty-five percent. I only have to have a couple of squares, and I don't I don't want any more. That's enough. Um, you know, it, when my friends are around having a jolly, I'll have a I'll have a gin and tonic, but I only need one or two glasses and that's enough. I don't need any more. And it, guess what? My jokes are much funnier when I've had a, a gin and tonic and um, uh, and sometimes I just fancy a piece of chocolate. But it's an occasional treat. It's mm. not an everyday staple. When we start using these addictions as everyday staples to get through life, that's the that's the that's trouble. Yeah. Well, you don't paint a very good picture for me then. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but but the point is, Chris, is that you can turn this around. Yeah. Now, having had testicular cancer, you are at increased risk of getting other cancers for the same reason you got testicular cancer in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you need to put in place now all the interventions to protect you against getting cancer. And number one is cutting out sugars and carbohydrates. And number two is cutting out dairy products because dairy products, dairy products are intended for young mammals, you know, and, um, you know, uh, I've got pigs at the moment and, you know, they're suckling their, 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 their sow like Billy Home. And guess what? They are growing faster than you've ever seen. You know, they double mm. their size in the first week and they kind of double it again in the next two or three weeks. So they grow at a fantastic rate. And that is driven by dairy products. So all dairy products are growth promoting. It makes perfect sense. If young mammals don't grow very quickly, they get gobbled up by saber toothed tigers. So it's perfectly logical. But uh, we know dairy products drive cancer. Uh, and two wonderful books written by um, Professor Jane Plant on this subject. Uh, her first book was called Your Life in Your Hands. And she describes how she had breast cancer um, and she had the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, the surgery, she had all the treatments. And she was told nothing more on offer. And she was left with a plum sized lump in her breast. She then read that in China, breast cancer is almost unheard of. In China, they don't have dairy products. It's not part of their cuisine. So she cut out dairy products and she watched that lump, you know, shrink and shrink and shrink and, 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 and go away. Now, she certainly got the dairy product side of things. She didn't get the carb side of things. She was still eating carbohydrates, but she went on to survive another all oh, 20, 30 years. Um, and she died age 72, not because of the cancer, but because of the chemotherapy. Just older. Oh, OK. <laughs> because of the chemotherapy. Yeah. So um, so she did very well. And then she repeated that research for prostate cancer uh, and found the same um, uh, uh, correlation. So, again. Um, prostate cancer, if you want to avoid that, cut out the dairy products, cut out the addictions, especially the sugars. Um, um, and anybody over the age of 50 should know what their PSA is, because that's a very useful guide to prostate health. It's not pathognomonic of cancer, but it's a very useful guide. Um, and that's an important test for all men. OK, that's good to know. Yeah, see, I love bread. Of I've, stopped, I've stopped buying shop bread. Because of all the additives, so I I tend to go to the bakery now. Okay. Um. So it's got slightly less crap in it, okay. but I still know it's still bad. Well, but what would be very useful for you to do and really interesting, and you could do that. Anybody can do this, is to purchase yourself a continuous glucose monitor. Now you can get them from our uh, um, on Amazon from a firm called Abbott Freestyle Libra. And you just plug it into the back of your arm. And believe you me, I've tried it. It's painless. So you just drop it on there. And then you take um, blood sugar readings with your smartphone. So it's very easy to do. And it gives you continuous glucose monitoring. Now, we, we like to see the blood sugar run between about 4 and 6.5. And it wants to stay there and be level. Now, I'll just give you an example. I was uh, on a riding holiday with a friend of mine. And uh, she was wearing one of these. We're in the middle of Sicily. Um, in the middle of nowhere and lunch was a large chunk of white bread and a bit of salami of course I ate the salami and fed the bread to the horse but she had, ate the whole thing her blood sugar spiked up to 11 
I have to say, I was really um, shocked and blown away by that. It did come down very quickly, so that tells us she's not diabetic. But it illustrates the point that, that, that white bread um, and probably brown bread as well, rice, many of these grains will have that effect on your blood sugar. Now, if you have any doubt or would like to you know, impress on yourself the importance of you can, you can buy one of these. It's called Freestyle Libre. It costs 50 quid, and that will give you two weeks of continuous blood sugar monitoring. So it gives you some very useful data, and you can see exactly what your blood sugars are doing. And that's very empowering um, to get onto a diet and to stick with that. So um, um, you know what you're doing is you are deceiving yourself. You're thinking, oh, you know, this bread is, or this 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 artisan um, bread is better than you know that that comes from the supermarket. Well, you might be right, but you might be very wrong. And my mm. guess is you are still spiking your blood sugars, and your blood sugars are all over the place. No, that, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. To be honest, it just tastes nice. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, no, 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 no. no I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop then. you there because we eat for two reasons. We eat for reasons of flavor and taste, and we eat for reasons of addiction. And until you've got that addictive bit out of it, then you misinterpret that as flavor. So you think um, chocolate and you know, a milk chocolate tastes nice. It doesn't. Once you are keto adapted, you will find it's far too sweet. It tastes awful, but it's giving you a sugar buzz. And you are interpreting that is as it tastes nice. Tastes nice. What tastes good is a good curry, you know, with lots of wonderful herbs and spices in there, um, which taste magnificent. Um, especially if you get the combination right from a good cook. Uh, and then obviously there's meat in there and maybe some vegetables. But your blood sugar levels will be absolutely level, but it tastes delicious. But to say, if you gave me a chocolate bar, okay, I would eat it under duress, but it wouldn't taste good and my blood sugars would be in the sky. Mm. See, one of the healthiest times I felt, not necessarily my skinniest times, but one of my where I felt better is when I was doing like the 17 hour fast. So I would have my last meal at about three o'clock in the afternoon and then not eat again until about 10, half 10 in the morning. Oh, but then very... I would just, and then I would just have like one piece of toast with all olive oil on it and like a poached egg or a um, hard boiled egg with some salad. Well, that would, that would be a very good start. And what you are describing is um, intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. And again, mm. that's the next evolution from the diet. So having got off the sugars and the carbohydrates and addictive foods, then it makes fasting much easier to do because you don't run out of fuel. You might get a few rumbles in your tummy, which is the, you know, the body saying or the brain saying, oh, it's time to have something to eat. But if you ignore the rumbles and the hunger pangs and ask yourself, How's the physical energy? Guess what? It's good. How's the mental energy? Guess what? It's good. Mm. So you can I you can keep going all day. Mm. And um but also a lot of those a lot of those rumbles that you get in your stomach, which are construed as hunger, a lot of the time that's thirst, isn't it? And that too. So um I time restrict eat, so and I advise my patients to do this once they're PK adapted. So I aim to eat all my food within a six hour window of time. That leaves you 18, 17, 18 hours of time of fasting. Um, so and effectively, that's what you did, um, mm. um, which is, and, and, every, and, and, and different people do it in different ways. Some people would have to say, I'd have breakfast and lunch and then no supper. I have no breakfast, but I have a late lunch and then I have supper. And, um, and I find that very satisfying. I don't get hungry. I can eat whatever I like. My weight stays exactly the same. But most importantly, I don't run out of mental energy and I don't run out of physical energy. No. No, that's, uh, yeah, I need to get back into that. I also need to start doing, uh, uh, you aware of Wim, Wim Hof? Indeed. Indeed, yeah. I'm on Wim Hof weekends at, uh, at my oh, did at my you? Not, not with Wim Hof, but one of his disciples. And again, it has profound effects on health. Now, I have to say, my brother's a very uh, keen Wim Hof advocate, and uh, and uh, he finds the breathing incredibly helpful. I have to say, I couldn't face the cold water plunges. I'm a complete wimp when that's uh, as far as that's concerned. So I like I like a nice warm pool. But people who do uh, get great benefit from it. And my guess is that the benefits of Wim Hof are derived because it gives the adrenals a kick. 
Mm. And um, and um, you know, when the adrenals are kicked, you pour out adrenaline and cortisol and DHEA, and they allow energy delivery mechanisms to gear up to a higher level. So we feel energized as a result of that. And guess what? When you've got energy, you can get a lot done. Mm. And it also helps with inflammation. Indeed, it's anti-inflammatory. Mm. That gets the thumbs up too. Yeah, I have to say, when I first started doing the, the breathing techniques, I was amazed at how high I felt. I know. Like the know. whole body just vibrated. I, like, I know. I know. And and again, you when you do the hyperventilation for maybe two minutes and then you stop breathing, I found I could hold my breath. I didn't need to breathe for about three minutes. I was going to say I three know. minutes was probably my, my limit. Yeah, I had no desire to breathe whatsoever. And I was in a state of complete, you know, euphoria. And I'm sure there, it, there's a great release of endorphins. So you feel relaxed and no need to breathe. It's a very nice feeling. So, yeah, I think the Wim Hof um, breathing techniques can be very helpful. And it goes further and you go deeper than you would if you were just meditating. Because mm. I've always struggled with the meditation. I love the idea of it, but I've always struggled with just sitting there doing nothing. It was like, that is my problem. That's mm. why I don't do it Wim Hof as regularly as I should, because I like my time to be usefully employed. I like to be doing things all the time. Now, I'm lucky I've got the energy to do that. So, you know, I'm usually I'm awake by half past five in the morning and I'm just doing and doing and doing things all day. Now, I used to be able to work until 10 o'clock at night. No problem at all. These days, I don't want to. Uh, mm. By five o'clock, um, that big one, by four o'clock in the afternoon, I've finished my medical work and then I'm outside, you know, sorting the garden, sorting the pigs, the horses, the chickens, the ducks. Um, uh, I, I grow all my own vegetables, so I'm preparing and I, I look after an old boy. In fact, just to illustrate how effective these regimes are, I say I, I look after an old boy who lives in the granny flat. And obviously, I feed him a paleo ketogenic diet and some vitamins, some minerals, and all, all, all else. And in July, we will celebrate his 102nd birthday. And wow. he is as sharp as a tack. He has no hint of dementia and really no pathology of any significance. So it just illustrates the point that you get the environment right. And, and he, he goes out for a walk every day still. You get the environment right. And you eat well and you keep warm in the house and you do a bit of exercise. You know, you can live life to its full potential in terms of quality and quantity. Wow. 102. <laughs> He's a really wow. interesting uh, 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 man. He fought through the Second World War in the Royal Navy, and he wrote a wonderful book about his experiences there called A Home on the Rolling Main. And it's a wonderful account of a naval life um, um, throughout the war. He said there were three things that we were frightened of. Number one was the weather. Number two was the chronic lack of sleep. And number three was the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that it be. <laughs> Blimey. So going back to the NHS then, do you do you see it ever getting any better? Or do you think that no, we're it, it, well, there are parts of the NHS that are absolutely fantastic. I mean, if I had an acute accident, um, then I want to go to accident emergency. If I wanted surgery, I want to go and see an NHS surgeon. They are second to none. The problem area comes with the drug prescribing doctors, the physicians who are using prescription medication to control symptoms, not to address the underlying causes of disease. So a very common problem um, is people come to me and say, I've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Well, irritable bowel syndrome is not a diagnosis. It's a clinical picture. We have to ask the question why. And there are two common drivers of irritable bowel syndrome. Number one is allergy to foods. And of course, the, 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 the top allergens are the gluten grains and the dairy products. Cut those out and you stand a very good chance of curing your irritable bowel syndrome. Number two is the upper fermenting gut. Now, I could talk all day about this. It's one of my favorite subjects. Oh, no. but, yeah, but, but the point here is that the upper gut, I mean, the, the distance between our mouth and our anuses is about 30 feet. We've got about 30 foot of gut that food has to pass down before it gets to the end. Now, the first 25 foot of gut is comprised of the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and small intestine. And that should be near sterile. It should be, um, it's kept sterile by S acid in the stomach and, uh, and it's there for us to digest meat and to digest fat. Now, the lower part of the gut, the last five foot is the colon, and that is full of bacteria. 
It's called our microbiome. It's a very important organ really in its own right. And it does lots of good things. It ferments fibers to generate energy. Um, it has the microbes generate and neurotransmitters and some vitamins and minerals. It helps to program the immune system. It does a lot of good. But I say that's a fermenting gut. Now, problems arise when our carbohydrate addict who has, you know, fruit juice and toast for breakfast and crisps and, and chocolate and stuff throughout the day, that overwhelms the ability of the upper gut to be sterile. And the microbes, particularly yeast, move in and start to ferment in the stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum, and maybe the small intestine. Is that what causes heartburn? Yes, correct. That is one cause of heartburn. But okay. as soon as you get a fermenting upper gut, you get lots of other problems. Now, first of all, um, if sugar is fermented by yeast in the upper gut, what do you get? You get alcohol. That's how we make beer and wine. And that alcohol poisons us and gives us a foggy brain. So, you know, if, if I had to have a glass of wine for breakfast, you know, nothing would get done in the day um, because I've got foggy brain. Uh, but it's not just ethyl alcohol. There's um, uh, propyl alcohol, butyl alcohol, ammoniacal compounds, hydrogen sulfide, delactate, a whole range of toxins are produced, which literally poison us and give us foggy brain and fatigue. And then the microbes themselves produce toxins. So bacteria produce bacterial endotoxin. Fungi produce fungal mycotoxins, and these all poison us as well. But more interesting than that, the microbes themselves can get into the bloodstream. It's called microbial translocation. And in the bloodstream, if they are unfriendly microbes that the immune system is not used to seeing, like because you know throughout evolution they've not been there, mm -hmm. then when these microbes get stuck in our joints, they will drive arthritis. They get stuck in our muscles. They drive muscle pain, maybe polymyalgia rheumatica. They get stuck in our arteries. They call arteritis. They get stuck in our lungs. We can get intrinsic asthma. If they get stuck in our gut wall, we can get inflammatory bowel disease. Um, if they get stuck in our bladders, we get irritable bladders and cystitis. So those microbes drive a huge a host of other pathologies, which I describe as allergy to microbes from the upper fermenting gut. So the treatment for that is, first of all, stop feeding those microbes with sugars and carbohydrates, because that's the only thing that they can ferment. So we start off with a paleoketogenic diet. And then we want to kill those microbes as well. And it's no good just having a course of antibiotics or a course of antifungals, because that will only last whilst you're on those antibiotics or those mm. antifungals. So um, we kill them with vitamin C and we kill them with iodine. And both vitamin C and iodine are one of my favorite multitasking tools because they do so much other good as well. How do you take the iodine? Do you take it in drop form or do you just have iodine rich like no. seaweed? Oh, okay. Lugol's iodine is very cheap. So I use Lugol's 15% iodine and three drops in a glass of water. Um, and uh, that is replaces the body with the iodine that it needs and does a very good job killing microbes in the upper fermenting gut. Now, the Can only... I ask you to send me a list of the things that you you use, like your iodine and and the other thing that you said, I can't remember what it is now, and I will put all that in the video description. So okay. if people want to go and get it, then I can That's put very the link kind. Uh, if, you, if you just go to sales at drmyhill.co.uk, all the um, um, products that I use are there. And I have a policy of pilot high and sell it cheap. And I do it that way because my special interests are people with fatigue syndromes. And when you have a serious chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, you can't work. And if you can't work, you haven't got any money. And therefore, mm. you can't afford the supplements you need to get well. So that's why I have the pilot high and sell it cheap philosophy. So a bottle of iodine like that, it costs about seven quid. And that will last you for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's a very cheap medication for the upper fermenting gut. And again, studies have been done looking at iodine deficiency throughout the world. And the bottom line here is iodine deficiency is the single biggest contributor to mental deficiency throughout the world. And you know, we, the whole world is iodine deficient. You know, we simply don't get enough of it in our diet. And of course that makes perfect sense because you know, where did primitive man and primitive woman evolve? Almost certainly on the shores of East Africa, living in the sea and eating a lot of shellfish and fish, all rich in iodine. And as soon as we became land-based, iodine deficiency became much, much more common. So we all need some iodine.
Fair enough. No, I've been told I need iodine, actually. I mean, I take sea kelp tablets, but I don't suppose that's the same. No, there's just there's just not the amount of iodine. It's got some iodine in it. It's better than nothing. But um, you know, why not just use bog standard Lugol's iodine? It's one of the oldest medicines. It's been available for over two hundred years, and it's highly effective. Um, in the nineteen twenties, you know, it was just routinely used to treat a whole host of things. In fact, there's a rather nice little ditto from the guy who discovered um, uh, vitamin C. Uh, which is uh, medical students were taught if ye if ye know not the where and why prescribe you then k and i i.e prescribe iodine it has so many applications well, that's good <laughs> i like that no awesome well listen thank you very much for your time i've really enjoyed listening to your knowledge and experience and i'd love to have you on again another day one day my pleasure just ask no brilliant well thank you so much and i hope everyone watching this has also taken away lots of decent knowledge that they can now apply to them and improve their lifestyles as well but for now all the best take care and i will speak to you again soon thank Bye. you Chris. nice one thank you very much <laughs>